Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning to everyone uh, in the room uh, and also uh, online. If you're on, online at the moment, if you could just write a quick chat message to say that you can hear me, that'll help us to make sure that all the tech's working and so you don't miss uh, half the presentation before we, we work that out. So let me know uh, in the chat if you can hear. Um, it's good to see you this morning. Thanks for coming out. Quite early in the morning, I got in this morning and thought 9.30 in the morning, second day of orientation week. I'm not too sure about this, but thanks for coming out. That's, I, I appreciate that effort. Um, I have some information here about an event app. Um, this is something you can download onto your phone and um, uh, put some uh, chat questions in um, for uh, our online. I've got Tio with me uh, here. Thanks uh, online for letting me know that it's all working. Um, uh, Tio will be having a look at the, the questions and everything that goes on in the chat during the session. And when I pause for questions, he'll ask those questions on behalf of the people online. Um, so they're the instructions for the app there. I'm sure you've seen them before, though, um, around orientation week. So welcome to Flinders University. Yesterday, we uh, actually launched a new logo. It's at the front here as well, uh, which is quite nice. It's um, something uh, quite new. Uh, Flinders has been around for a bit more than uh, 60 years. I can't remember the exact. I think it's getting close to 70 years, actually. Um, and this is um, a change to our logo. So that's quite new. Um, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, uh, and also uh, the traditional owners of the lands that uh, everyone is joining us from uh, in the online space, uh, and I pay my respects to uh, their elders, uh, both past and present. So um, a bit about me, my name's Matt, I'm from the Student Learning Support Service. Um, my colleague Tia is also from the Support Service. Um, we're a group of people uh, on campus uh, and we're specialists in uh, learning, uh, student learning. Uh, we have diverse backgrounds ourselves. Uh, we've been researchers for, for long periods of time um, and we're very passionate about um, your learning at university. So we have sessions like this today. Um, we had one yesterday, we have one later today at 1.15, 1.30, something like that. Um, so we run sessions like this. We also have a constant present on, uh, presence on campus. Um, a lot of students forget about us but we're actually uh, a good group and good people to have on your team. So at any stage during your studies, uh, especially during first year perhaps, uh, you can come and see us and ask us questions um, uh, about all kinds of things. Um, this presentation today is a bit of a, a starter to some of the terminology that we use at the university to help orientate you uh, when you're on campus. Uh, okay, so some of those things you might already know. Um, a lot of it might be very new to you. Um, but the whole purpose of this presentation is to give you some sort of orientation to the terminology at Flinders, uh, what Flinders is like in terms of assessments uh, and grades. Um, nothing too in-depth, of course, because uh, assessments, and, uh, assessments uh, and the university um, in different pockets uh, is very different. And so that's something that you will learn about later on in the semester. Um, but this is a bit of an overview. Uh, I've put together a lot of uh, slides and I'll be talking a lot this morning, I apologise for that, um, but all of this is to try and answer some of your questions that you're likely to have. Having said that, I do want you to ask questions uh, when you have them. I'll stop halfway through uh, after talking about some terminology um, for some questions, and then I'll stop at the end, obviously, um, for some questions about uh, assessment and uh, anything more. So please don't feel um, like you can't ask questions. This whole session is for you to have some of your questions answered. So. Uh, at the Student Learning Support Service, we have a whole bunch of things. We help students with uh, EndNote. This is a program uh, to help you do referencing at university. Um, we have a support service called the Learning Lounge. This is uh, an open area in the, um, in the library. I'll get to in a second on another slide where you can come in and have some support from uh, people like me, uh, learning advisors. Um, we also have an online um, service, Studiosity, to help in a similar way uh, in an online context. Uh, and we have a bunch of other things. Uh, you can find us uh, on your Flow dashboard, Flinders Learning Online. Um, it's uh, our learning management system. It's where you'll get a lot of your study materials, resources uh, during your degree uh, every semester. And as a student at Flinders, you automatically have this that appears um, on your dashboard. If you click through to this, that's our site. We're constantly developing it. Um, this image we will uh, develop further, um, but essentially uh, this is a bit of a gateway to a lot of different study resources uh, we have. Um, 
these, on, on the Flow site, you can click on these. Um, one of them, for example, you can click on these writing essays. It has some information to help you um, when you're tackling essay writing, for example. Um, there's a lot of other stuff uh, as well as essay write, uh, writing. Um, but any extended prose like an essay, if you click through to that, you get a bit of an outline of a mock essay uh, with some parts highlighted, for example. Uh, this is actually, sorry, a scientific report, not an essay. I changed that image. Um, highlights an abstract section, introduction section, all of this. If you click on these bubbles, you'll go through to some further resources to help unpack that for you. So, for example, if you have a question, oh, what is supposed to be in this introduction section? Or what is supposed to be in an abstract? What do they look like? Um, uh, what more can I learn about that? If you click through these, uh, you can find some of our resources on that. Uh, like I said before, the Learning Lounge uh, is in level two of the Central Library here um, at the Bedford Park campus. Um, when you walk up the stairs from the main entrance of the library, you'll see the commons written here, and you'll see some tables here. Between 10.30 and 12, and 12.30 and 2.30, every day of semester, um, we have a few learning advisors that sit there. Currently, they're sitting on the chairs back here. Uh, and you can just walk in at any time and ask them questions uh, and get some support uh, for your study. Um, like I said, in the online space, um, through your Flinders Learning Online dashboard, you can also find similar support through Studiosity. And so having a mixture of these different support options um, to help you um, is, is something which is very valuable and something to remember uh, when you study at Flinders because all of that support is there for you. So like I said, um, today we've broken um, down into uh, talking about assessments and also talking about some of the language we use at the university. There are four parts. I'll break after the second part and at the end for questions. So colleges and courses. What, what basically is the university and why are we all here? Everyone at the university, and this is very key, works with knowledge. And that's everyone. That's students, that's you. Uh, lecturers, like me. Professors, researchers, everyone here works around knowledge. We all create new knowledge. That is, we read about uh, research, we read about, um, we read texts, um, and we create from that new knowledge, our analysis of that, our new insight and our thoughts about that, we create knowledge. Uh, we put knowledge into practice. We take those uh, things that we know, that we learn, we put it into practice, so we're all expert practitioners. And certainly when we graduate from our degree, we become expert practitioners in our fields. And we all learn new knowledge. We are all students for life. Uh, that's a very key uh, idea at the university. Um, it's not like you come and do your degree and then that's it. You, you, know, you, know, you know how to be a, a nurse or you know, you know how to be a lawyer. You have to continue learning for life. And that's um, a key value that everyone has at university. And, and everyone, students, professors, as I said, do all three of these things. So you are an equal part um, in this as myself and everyone else. Um, but uh, at the university, we have different areas of focus. Okay? You can't um, just learn about everything all at once. Uh, and it would take a lifetime to become um, an expert, in a real expert in one area. But we have them broken up into areas of interest. And these are called the colleges. At other universities, they might be called faculties. Um, but at Flinders, there are six, and they're called colleges. One of them um, is focused on business, government, and law. Another one is education, psychology, and social work, humanities, arts, social sciences, medicine and public health, nursing and health sciences, and sciences and engineering. So when you go and study um, first year chemistry, for example, you will likely study that with some people who work uh, more predominantly or exclusively in the, the, school, uh, the College of Science and Engineering. When you do um, uh, a legal topic, you will um, likely learn from academics who work primarily in the um, College of Business, Government and Law. So you will mix between these different colleges, learning different things on road to your degree. Okay? But because of your degree, you might be located more in one college than another. So all six colleges 
focus on different areas of knowledge. Um, so your degree. Uh, your degree, at the, the degree program is at Flinders called a course. Okay, so this is some of the terminology. Uh, it's called a course, it's also a degree program. It's the whole thing that you do, okay? It's actually a collection of topics, okay? So the degree is not a single thing you go into, you have all your peers, you stay with all your peers all the way through, maybe like it's a class at school, okay, and finish with your cohort. That's not really how it happens. You do have a cohort for the year, but you all go and study different things from different colleges at different times, often. And those topics can come from any college. So that's a key difference. It's kind of like making a patchwork quilt, okay? Your degree is the whole quilt, and it has patches that you need to make it up with, and those patches are the topics. And they can come from anywhere at the university. Some of those patches that you have in your quilt are must-do patches. They're called core topics. So if you study in the Bachelor of Teaching, there are some certain pieces of this quilt to get that degree, certain topics in that degree, you simply must do. Otherwise, you won't graduate as a teacher and you won't be registered as a teacher. Okay, so they are core topics. For example, nursing, teaching, engineering, those ones where you get an accreditation as a professional, especially, there are a lot of core topics. And so the other people that are uh, enrolled in that degree will, hit, will have a similar looking quilt to you as well. Sometimes you get a choice of focus, okay? And these are called major or minor sequences. For example, if you study a Bachelor of Arts, you might decide that you like history, modern history. So you decide to major in modern history. That means that a certain number of topics, okay, in here will be about history related things so that you can graduate with a history major. There are other sequences which are called minors, which are smaller amounts, okay? So for example, when I did my um, undergraduate degree a while ago, I actually graduated with an extended major, so at that time it was more than a major, a lot more, in chemistry. Okay, so I'm a chemist, um, and I did a minor in mathematics. And the reason why I did a minor in mathematics is because I wanted to leave open the option of teaching in a school. And I needed to do a minor in mathematics and have that qualification in order to teach mathematics. So that's why I did that. Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts are the typical two which have a very broad um, range of different pathways that you can take. You can choose the major you want. You might, after first year, think, I want to major in physics, okay? Or I want to um, major in uh, public policy, okay? You can take those major pathways, choose the, the quilt um, as you like, as long as you make a major portion of a particular focus area. So that's the idea with majors and minors. They're still made up of topics, but it depends on the selection. Okay, and how that looks for an overall quilt, um, or overall degree. Sometimes you have free choice, okay? As part of your degree, there are, there are parts of it where the university says, you can pick whatever you want. It doesn't matter what you do, just study something, okay? And they're called electives. And so especially with Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts, of course, in a lot of others, you'll have a certain degree of electives. Sometimes the university says, you can have an elective, but pick between these ones because they're the ones that will most help you to become an expert practitioner when you graduate, okay? But elective means you have choice. And so you can see that people doing the same degree, even though they're doing the same degree, can end up having a whole bunch of different things they study. Okay, so that's the breakdown of um, the degree. Um, support services, as I said before, there are many different ways in which you are supported uh, at university. University is about your own learning. So when you come into a class, it's important that you focus on your own learning and think, what do I know about what Matt's talking about now? What don't I know about what he's talking about? You might know a lot about what, I know, what I'm talking about right now, but you might think to yourself, I know a lot about this already, but is he gonna say something which teaches me a little bit more, right? Or you might think, I really don't know what he's talking about here. What can I take from what he's talking about now? Okay, and then build upon that later. It's a very individual thing, but you actually have a lot of support available. The library has um, many people to support you. The library at university is a lot larger than you think. 
it's not just a building filled with books on a shelf. It has access to all the information that the whole university uses. We have subscriptions to international journals. Um, this is where all of the knowledge and information is published. You can't always access that just by Googling, okay? Um, and the library is very helpful in helping you to access that information, use that, uh, and find the stuff that's most appropriate for you. Flinders Connect, um, this is a, a service um, on the ground floor of the library, so it's actually um, on plaza level, so below the main entrance. They can help you. Anything you need, if you need to collect your ID, if you want to pick up a, uh, a, 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 um, uh, anything from university, if you need some support but you're not sure where to go to, if you go to Flinders Connect, they all know that stuff and they basically tell you, oh, you need to talk to, to Matt at Student Learning Support Service. This is where he is. Go and talk to him. He'll help you with, uh, what, with what you need. Flinders Connect is very useful. There are a lot of health uh, services on campus. There's a GP on campus. There's a pharmacy as well. Um, there's um, disability support service. There's a lot of health services available. Um, we also have a team that helps you think about careers and employability after graduating from university. They help you to think about what you can do now to help set you up for employment when you, when you graduate. There's a whole bunch of support services. It's all there for you. And all you need to do is reach out and seek those services when you need them. The important thing is to know they are there. So while it's a very individual thing at university, you learn and, and you think about your own learning, you try and progress your own learning, um, there's a lot of support there um, to help you, to help you achieve that. And we're very interested in helping you to achieve um, the best that you can. Okay, like I said, Student Learning Support Service, that's us. We can give you tips, hints and advice um, because we're experts in, in learning. That's our field. Okay, so we'll just recap that first bit. The language we, I love this bird. I think that's a great uh, little guy there. I like to see him around campus. Okay, language at Flinders. We talked about colleges, services, degrees, courses. The course is the degree. Okay, that's the language we use. Um, it's different to Adelaide University, okay. Um, topics, okay, these are the, si the single subjects that you, that you study in a semester. I forgot to mention that. So heading to semester one, if you have a full-time load, you'll study four topics, typically, okay, for your degree. Majors, minors, core topics, and elective topics. Okay, I'll talk a bit about this first, and then I'll stop for some questions. Um, lectures, tutorials, and learning activities. Okay, the guts of what we do at the university. Um, there are many of them, okay? Le this is kind of like a lecture, okay? Lectures, tutorials, workshops, laboratories, online activities, there's a whole bunch of different things you interact with. Uh, and it's all there for you, okay? Uh, and you don't have to look at any of it if you don't want to. Um, but obviously, I would say to you, that it's a good idea to engage with these as much as possible. And every time you engage with these, take it as an opportunity to learn something more, okay? Every time. No matter how well you already know that stuff, no matter how poorly you know it at this time, always try and push a little bit further with your learning. Lectures are a bit like this, okay? It's a forum where there's um, someone who's talking about specialist knowledge. Okay, I'm just talking to you about orientation stuff today. Um, but in your lectures, um, the whole idea is that a specialist will talk to a large audience about something, okay? So I'm not going to have uh, an intimate discussion about this with you today because the group's a little too big, okay? So the idea of a lecture is a large audience and someone shares some specialist knowledge for you to think about. It's also, uh, it's done in live theatres. It also can be done through short videos. You have a short video, it's a bit like a lecture. You have an expert talking about things they know and you listen to it, you try and learn from that and you follow things up if you don't know about them, okay? That's the idea. Um, and also lectures often happen these days in the online space as well. And we have people with us today who are watching this um, um, on the online space. Okay, my advice, to listen actively. Okay, if I say actively listen, you've heard that many times, okay? But basically, you have to kind of listen past the words that I say um, as a lecturer and try and understand the meaning of what I'm talking about. What am I trying to get at, okay? This is kind of an idea of active listening, okay? Um, reflecting on your own thinking 
and the thinking that I'm presenting to you and weighing those things up. Okay, how do I think about support services at university? What's Matt saying about it? What does he think about it? Should I change the way that I think about it? Okay, and that might be productive for me or help me in the future. This kind of idea, active listening. Um, take notes as you learn new ideas or are challenged, but don't over note take. Okay, it's not, like I said, it's not the literal words that I say which make, which make the most difference. It's the meaning behind it, okay? So you can take notes about new ideas that you learn or are challenged by that you might revisit later on and think, oh, I didn't quite understand what he said about this. Maybe I'll follow that up somewhere else. You can also write questions to ask tutors uh, and peers outside of the lecture. Tutorials and workshops is uh, one idea, um, uh, is one uh, uh, place where you can do that. So after a lecture, um, an expert's just talked to a whole group of people. You've been listening intently. You've been thinking about your own learning, things that you, uh, questions you have, all of this kind of stuff. And where do you go to ask those questions? You can do it in the lecture, and you can always do that in the lecture. But otherwise, tutorials and workshops are a good place for that, especially if you want to discuss it a bit more. Okay? This is an extension to lecture-based content typically. Normally, in this, you discuss thoughts and issues with a smaller group of people. Okay, like 10 people, 15 people, even smaller sometimes. Um, you practice problems or calculations depending on your field. Obviously, if you know, you, you, you're studying science, you would do a bunch of problems and you'll talk to people about those problems, how to solve them, what they mean, um, uh, all of the, the theories that come into that. And um, from a, an, a, a more arts perspective, um, you talk about issues and you discuss those and you practice arguing those issues. And importantly, ask questions. It's no good going to a workshop and tutorial just doing problems, getting stuck on them and thinking, oh, look at that later. That's the time and place to ask, why, you know, why, does, why is it like this? Or why do you think that? Um, and that's kind of pushing the envelope further to uh, learn a bit more uh, and, and, and um, kind of tease your own, uh, your own learning there. All right, attended by groups of students, is very focused on your learning journey. And now everything is focused on your learning journey, but this is a bit more intimate. Okay, you can ask those questions. It's very tailored to what you know. You know. If, um, if I'm having a workshop or a tutorial with, with you, uh, an intimate lesson with only a few people, and I want you to learn as much as you can, and it appears from, for me, as an educator, that you're not quite, you know, um, you haven't made, you've made so much progress with your learning, and I can see that, I will target you where, I'll meet you where you're at and try and push you as far as I can, right? And so the more you tell me about what you know and what you don't know, the easier it is for me as an educator to meet you where you're at and to help you progress further, okay? So you have to be very open and honest about those things and, and try and facilitate that process as well. Okay, important to say that in these sessions to be respectful to your peers and your teachers, how much they have learned so far, the opinions and arguments they bring to class, okay? Um, we, we have a very open mind at university and we respect people's arguments, their opinions uh, and their experiences. So that's very important in the online space as well to be respectful to your peers. So labs and pracs. These are kind of um, more uh, practice-based learning and, it, and it's normally more focused on the field that you'll, you'll go into. Okay, there's, for example, chemistry labs. Obviously, I did that when I was an undergraduate. Um, there are biology labs. There are all these science labs, but there are also um, uh, practical experiences uh, in social work um, and law and all kinds of things. Okay, so it's not just um, exclusive to the clinical setting or the laboratory setting. There's a lot of practice-based stuff to do. They are, they are essentially specialised workshops. Again, it's an intimate setting. Again, you want to push your, your learning, um, but you will be practising more closely the work and skills of a professional. So what are some tips? Read widely. The better you prepare to go in to a practical-based um, learning opportunity, 
the more you'll get out of it. So read about it beforehand. Be aware of safety procedures, these standard things that you might not know about yet, but that's important to do before you get there so you can make the most of the learning experience. Um, because it is a good opportunity to go in these. You can't normally do this. Without the university, you can't normally walk into a lab and try some things out, um, go into a clinical setting, um, go into a moot court, right, all of this stuff. Become familiar with typical field-specific rules. And often your lecturer will provide you with a bit of uh, some notes, uh, some preparation work before going to practical-based um, learning opportunities. Make sure to read those and become familiar with them so that when you step into the, to the, the place, the professional space, you have some familiarity with it and you can just focus on the new stuff and the experience and putting that into context. Um, study what you have learned in class, obviously, as preparation. Online activities. Um, there are many online activities that you'll find um, through uh, Flow. And um, we also use Collaborate uh, as a, a live streaming um, uh, video platform. Um, so there will be lectures, tutorial, problems, workshops, sometimes in the online space, obviously. Um, videos and text, interactive content, discussion forums uh, to contribute to where people add their ideas. You read those ideas, contribute to them a bit, have a bit of a class discussion. Depending on what you study, you will have various elements of this. Sometimes all of them, sometimes not much of them. But again, it's another um, place where you can um, uh, test your knowledge and, and interact with that and learn something from it. Um, the most important thing is this uh, consolidation of, of what you've learned and read. So whatever you see in class, uh, you go to a lecture. Um, I've heard from many students before, I went to all the lectures. It's not enough. Right? It's not enough to just go to the lectures and to turn up. Turning up is important. Going to the lectures is important. Um, reading the texts or having a go at reading the text is important. But what's more important is that you consolidate those ideas. And that's why in your timetable, you typically have a lot of time. Okay? You might have a, a lecture, a couple of lectures on Monday, you know, a bit of a, a, a lab on, on Wednesday, whatever. You've got a lot of holes um, in your timetable. It's like Swiss cheese. Those holes you want to fill with your own time consolidating work. I know that you've got other work and stuff that you've got to do, but the whole point of us giving you a full-time study load with a lot of holes is for you to do this. Your own practice, your own reflection on how you're going with your progress, your own further reading, and following up those things you don't quite understand, and the things that you do understand, also consolidating that as well. So this is a very important process, consolidating. Um, here, make good use of your own study time. All right, so activities at Flinders, we talked about what lectures are, what tutorials are, they're different. Lectures and tutorials are different. Large class, not that much interaction, sometimes a bit of interaction, but it's for a bigger group. Tutorials are more intimate. Workshops are also more intimate and a bit more practical based. Laboratories are practical based in the setting of expertise, like a lab, clinical setting, moot court. Um, you also have activities to do online, which are very useful. They're very, very useful to do, and it takes a lot of time to prepare those. I know, it takes a lot of time to prepare those, so I spend a lot of my time doing that. Um, practical work, Flinders Learning Online, Learning Management System, make sure to always be on that. Um, collaborate, okay, and consolidation, importantly, is a learning process. So, um, with that, I will stop and ask for questions about that first half. Yes. Um, so back on the topic of like uh, your course structure, um, with double degree, is it true that you don't do like electives, you do two electives? Yes, the question was for the people online, with a double degree, um, it takes less time to do a double degree, and do you do a reduced number of elective topics, for example? The answer broadly, I'm not really a specialist to talk in this area, there are other people at university who can talk more to this, but broadly, yes, that's the idea. So if you do a double degree in teaching and arts, it only takes four years, I think, something like this, double degree. What they'll do is, in working out the structure, they won't just get you to do endless electives, like doing two separate degrees. They'll concentrate it and say, okay, if you want to do, if you want to be an arts teacher, a humanities teacher, whatever, at school, 
you do uh, education, arts, and what we'll do is you do all the core topics from education, you do a major in the arts, that's what you need to, to teach, okay? So you do that first, and if there's any time left, then you can do electives. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You concentrate the degrees into their, their bare bones, their essence. So if you, if you are interested in doing that, uh, you know, for example, um, being a teacher, um, doing a double degree, there's a whole bunch of other double degrees. I just haven't looked at it. It's the only one that comes to mind. Um, the double degree is a good idea if you want to do that. I thought about doing a double degree too when I was an undergraduate, but I decided to just focus on science first because they had a master's degree in teaching and I thought I'll just leave the teaching till later. You know, if I, I decided not to do it in the end, so I became a researcher instead. But yes, double degrees are very effective. So one extra year, but you get two degrees, typically. Are there any other questions? Yes? Yes, the library has a, a database. Um, broadly, it's called Find It at Flinders. Okay, good. <laughs> um, yes, uh, and libraries are the best people to talk about that. But yes, it has a search engine which grants you access to all of those subscriptions uh, that the uh, library has. A lot of it is available in the digital space as well. So there are hard copy books. There are some um, texts which are only hard copy books, but many books and almost all journal articles um, are available online. Uh, and find it at Flinders is, uh, so find it, F-I-N-D-I-T, at, at symbol Flinders, um, that's, that's where to find it. And if you go to the library um, page on the website, you can't miss it, it'll be there. Follow the links for that. Yes, a good question. Do we have any questions online? Yes, from the online audience. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is the meaning of class? on flow via Collaborate or recording and attendance mode in person or at Flinders? Oh, okay. Is this, this is like... Um... So I think, I think he's asking for the definition of class on flow. So when there's a class, what does a class mean? Mm. Uh, Do you think there's anything specific that's called a yeah, class? Uh, if I may answer yes, the question, uh, I think I think uh, Dashit uh, essentially when when you say when the, when you use the term class, it is a very loose term to mean a tutorial. Essentially, most most lecturers will call this a tutorial, in a sense that if you go on online and you study online, a tutorial is where you discuss uh, your your lecture materials, and uh, exactly like what has Matt has has uh, presented earlier on about lectures and tutorials. So that's the in the relationship between the two. And a class on your collaborate generally refers to a tutorial session. Uh, the next question is this from Emily. Uh, are all health services available to regional students? Uh, I think this is a question which relates more to health counselling and disability. So to answer that question, uh, I think it's best if you go to the health counselling and disability website, just Google for it in Flinders, and the information should be over there. Right? Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so health, health, just to repeat that, health counselling, disability, and, and at, you know, at Flinders, and you'll find that page with the, with the information. And I would reiterate the, cl the class is, is not a technical term that we use. Mm. Um, a lot of the people that work here come from, from many different places in the, in the world. Um, and they, they bring their own terminology as well a little bit. So it's, it's good to be aware of that. Um, you know, for people who come, I, I worked at the University of Adelaide before coming here uh, quite recently. And when I came, I had to change the way that I talk about topics to say topics, because I used to call them courses and then people would be, because that's what they call it there and people get confused. So um, yeah, keep in mind that there's a lot of people from different parts of the world that come in and, and might use different terminology sometimes. Yes? Yeah. And, and one last question from Arsha, uh, which is, sorry, from Arjun, uh, as in like, do you need to uh, take all the electives in a course? Yes, you do need to take all the electives because um, to get your degree, um, to use the quilt analogy, you do have to have a quilt that's big enough, right? So as part of your, you know, co um, course rule, degree um, rule makeup, they'll say something typically like, oh, you have to have a hundred and... I can't, forget, I can't remember the th three years must be 100 and 
108, I think, 108 units, okay? Which basically means you have to study enough topics. And when a topic is worth, for example, four and a half units, I think they're all worth four and a half units, and you do a full-time study load, you do 18 units per semester, basically that's the value of the topics that contribute to the overall number of units, right? So instead of saying you have to study 20 topics in your degree, because some topics might be bigger than others, they tend to be all the same these days, but historically there used to be some are bigger than others, you have to make sure you study enough. So um, yes, you have to make um, up the number of units to get your degree. And you can't do more, you can't do less. Right? So you, you're supposed to, for, for, to get the degree, you're supposed to do exactly this many units. Um, and it's good to talk to a degree advisor about that. But yes, you do have to do all your electives. One way that you can get around doing some electives is if you've done some of that study beforehand. For example, if you've already studied in another degree or you know, you've, you've worked in a particular setting and you have um, this uh, recognition of prior learning, um, but that's, you have to go through a process where that's recognised and the university reviews it and says, yes, you've done this before, so you don't have to do these, you know, it's some of your electives or you don't have to study this as part of your degree. You've all, you already know it, right? Um, but that's a separate process. So broadly, yes, you have to do all of, all of your study, all of your electives. You get a choice, but you have to do all of them. Um, okay, so I think we'll continue. Um, or we'll take questions again at the end of course. Uh, assessments, okay, what are they and why do we do them? So this is really um, a, a critical part in what you're thinking about university, right? Assessment's really important um, for you. Um, you know, assessment, you know, you kind of think that, you know, you're being judged, okay, you do a lot of work on something. Um, you're learning something as well, so you don't have a lot, you often don't have a lot of confidence, right, because it's something new to you. You know, you've never produced an essay in, in law before. Or if you have, you've never produced one at the second year level. Or you've never talked about constitutional law before and you're, you're doing this assessment. Um, you know, assessment's one of those areas where, you know, you, you put yourself out there with an assessment piece. You try your hardest, but nonetheless you have this assessment, so there's kind of like a judgment on how well you've done, right? Um, I want you to have a very positive mindset about assessment. Okay, because we want you to become an expert practitioner at the end of your degree, okay? And so what we do is we have assessments now and then where we just get you to have a go at doing something and then we'll have a look at it and we'll provide you feedback to help push you along to get you to the finish line, okay? And it doesn't really matter how um, far you've come along that journey. We'll let you know how far you've come along that journey and we'll try and support you to keep going, okay? So assessment, right, are learning activities Okay, that are assessed by your lecturer or lecturer. Um, and the important thing is assessed, not judged. Okay. Um, the assessments are detailed in the statement of assessment methods. So even before you take a topic, you can have a look at the statement of assessment methods or SAM, and it says there's an essay in this one, there's, a, there's three lab reports in this topic, altogether they're worth 20% of your final grade, all of this stuff. All of the assessments are placed in the SAM, and you can freely um, have a look at that. Um, what are the assessment types? There are essays, reports, presentations, you know, oral presentations, for example, poster presentations, this kind of thing. Um, quizzes to, to test knowledge. Um, they have, have um, quizzes with questions where it tests your recall of certain facts and things which are important to the field you're working in or going to work in. Um, and of course, examinations, which is a really big quiz. Um, Jeff Masters um, works at the Australian Council for Educational Research. They do a lot of research and assessment. Um, I've learned from this group before um, about assessment. And he says this, the purpose of assessment is to measure where you are in your learning journey at the time of assessment. And that is precisely what it is. It's not a judgment of how intelligent you are, okay, which is not changeable. Intelligence is, and, and what you know is changeable. There are neurons in your brain and you can make new connections all the time, okay? It's plastic. Just because you're not an engineer now doesn't mean you won't be an engineer by the end of your degree, okay? And we know that. So assessment is like a measuring stick, okay? At the end of the measuring stick, you're an engineer, okay? At the start of the measuring stick, you're here, 
okay? And as you go through, we have marks where we say, okay, by here, we expect you to kind of be here, kind of be here, kind of be here, to scaffold that whole process. And our teaching revolves around that, okay? So here, there's no assessment, okay, of your intelligence. It's not a fixed thing, it's something changeable. It's an assessment of how much you've learned at the time in which we assess you, and we give you feedback about that. So it's better to approach assessment in a positive way, such that when I submit an assessment and get feedback from that, that gives me an idea as to how well I'm going. If you get a low mark, that's not to say that you can't do it. It's just to say, I have to put a little bit more effort into these areas. Maybe there are some specific things that you just don't quite understand yet, which have caused that to happen in the assessment. And sometimes they can be very easily addressed. Right? If you do very well, don't think that you're already an engineer or you're extraordinarily clever. It means that you've made great learning progress so far based on these increments. There's still work to do. Okay? So um, your performance on assessments will vary throughout your degree. And as you go, you'll keep getting better and better as long as you put in effort to do that. Okay, so what other types of assessments do you get? There is extended uh, responses, um, essays, reports, presentations. Typically, these are things where you write a lot or you, you present and you talk a lot, right? They're things where you give all of the things that you know and you try and present that to your assessor. And they make a judgment on all the different things that they see from you as to how well you're going, all right? So in order to prepare and to perform on these, read widely. Okay, because you're going to be giving a lot of information, you're going to be giving a lot of inf uh, analysis, you need to be behind a, um, a lot of stuff in order to do that. Okay? Think very deeply about those things. What do they mean? Right? So when you're talking about different chemical reactions, different laws, um, different moments in modern history, think deeply about what they mean and how they're interconnected, not just the facts. Not just the straight facts, think deeply about how they're interconnected what do they mean in the grand scheme of things? Okay, because you tell me all these dates, modern history, you know, this happened, this war happened, you know, um, there was, you know, this, um, this event and this event. But then I say to you as an assessor, but how are they connected? What, you said that this happened and this happened, but how do they relate? Why did that happen first? You know, I'm testing that deeper knowledge, right? Do you know how they interrelate? Would that second event have happened if the first one didn't happen? That deeper stuff, that's for extended response, okay? Apply what you've learned, communicate with detail, okay? With detail um, is the important thing. Completely opposite to that is short response type questions, okay? These are when you're given tests or quiz, uh, quizzes. You typically pr provide less than a sentence or two or, or, or up to two paragraphs of response, really short response. Even multiple choice, you select a response, okay? And this is in a very focused area of the curriculum, right? Um, you know, you might have weekly quizzes in a topic. And they just test recall for certain facts as you go along. And it's designed to kind of help you to, to keep up with incoming new um, facts to recall, which are important as time goes by. That's the point of quizzes. They are very useful um, to, to do in time, but also to revise later. Uh, examinations are like a huge quiz and it's typically at the end of a semester. And it gets you to recall a lot of information, okay? Like for example, if you're going to be a clinician, um, even though you can do, you know, you have to do a lot of analyses and deep thinking about a lot of things, you also need to recall a lot of facts because you need to be able to remember that clinically significant stuff and process and protocol, okay? That's very important for that. So the uh, same happens in sciences like biology and things like this. So a lot of the time you do have exams where you test that recall, okay? It's, it's an important, important idea. Um, there'll be different types of questions depending on area of study, so I'm not giving you any typical questions here because they'll vary depending on what you're studying greatly. Um, but the tip here is to provide answers of appropriate level of detail. Not only to study, study that recall beforehand and practice that recall, obviously, have test examinations, all this kind of stuff, but to provide answers with an appropriate level of detail. If you're only required to write a sentence, don't write a paragraph because the assessor only wants you to generate one piece of information, recall one piece of information. 
if they're asking you to write two paragraphs on something, don't write a sentence or a word because it's not enough. Right? They're looking for you to recall more things, maybe even bring in a bit of analysis okay, in that response. So modify the amount of, um, in, a, in an exam situation, modify the level of detail to suit what you're being asked. Okay? Uh, and so one important thing is uh, at university and, to, to, and in study and doing assessments is answer the whole question and nothing but the question. Right? So answer the question, you've got to answer the question. If you don't answer the question, it doesn't matter what rich information you provide about something, it's not relevant because you haven't answered the question. So read the question, understand it, answer it, and answer all of it, but don't answer anything more. Okay? That's a, a good, a hot tip. All right. Um, yes, there are skills-based practical assessments, a lot of laboratory, field work, um, all kinds of assessments. Typically, that's hands-on assessment. You know, how well do you uh, set up a cannula for a patient, right? Um, how well do you do kind of these more mechanical things um, and procedural things? We've got someone here doing pipetting. Uh, there, there are a lot of techniques behind doing that. I don't know how to do them because I didn't study that. Um, but you're assessed on how you do that. Because if you do it, if you haven't developed those skills, you won't get accurate results. Um, okay, and assessments and feedback tell you how much you have learned, where you are currently at in your learning journey, and what to learn next. And then that what to learn next is the next bit in that iterative process of learning at university over three years. Okay, assessment at Flinders. We talked about assessments, obviously. The statement of assessment methods document at the beginning of um, your topic, always available to you, so you can see what you have to do. You write a report, um, do an examination worth 50%, right, something like this. Tells you all about what's going to go on in the topic ahead of time, so you can maybe plan for that and prepare for that as you do your uh, other study. Essays, reports, presentations are long answer things. You have to bring a lot of deep thinking, a lot of detail to those, and preparation. Test quizzes, examinations, Typically test recall, sometimes they do a bit more. Also takes preparation, but the way that you respond is a bit different, okay? Um, Skills-based and practical assessment, hands-on stuff. Um, didn't really mention, I must have had the curriculum in there before. Curriculum is basically all the stuff that you will learn, right, in, um, in your degree and your topics, uh, and it's structured in a certain way to get you to being an expert at the end. And feedback's very important. Um, feedback is, is the most um, useful thing to help you to um, take the next step in your, in your learning. Okay, I'll go through this and then we'll have questions um, and we'll go through it as quick, quickly as we can. Um, there is a grading scale, okay. All those things that I said to you about assessment before hold true, okay, um, about it just being a, a yardstick to help you along. But in the end we have these grade categories that go on a transcript, okay? So um, if you get you know, a, an aggregate score of about 85%, typically is aligned with a high distinction, and that is worth seven points on your academic record, okay? So 85% and above, it's called a high distinction, and you get s the maximum seven points for your academic record. If you get a distinction in a topic, between 75 and 84 percent as an aggregate, you get a point score of six. Credit, the, the numbers are there, point score of five. Pass, okay, point score of four. And if you go all the way through a topic, the whole thing, um, do the examination, whatever, all of this stuff, and your score is less than 50 percent, um, that's a fail, and so that won't actually contribute to your degree. It's like the, the piece of patchwork won't go into your quilt, okay? So you redo it if it's a core topic. If it's an elective, you might choose to study something else, but you've got to study something else, okay? And that contributes, it's not like it never happened. It contributes a score of zero to your average, okay? So that's how it works. There are other topics um, that are non-graded passes. Basically, you just pass it and that's it. So you don't get a point score, but it doesn't count to your average. You just have to pass it. It's like a hurdle, okay? It's an all or nothing thing. Um, there are some other things which are important to mention, and they're about withdrawing, okay? So um, there is a withdrawal. Oh, I haven't updated these dates. Sorry about that. 
there are updated dates for this. So um, you can actually go through a topic and think, no, nah, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm having a hard time. I need to do less or I'll just attempt this another time, okay? You can withdraw without failing. And there's a particular date for that. It's not that one. That's passed already. And it's like it didn't happen, okay? No point score. If you wait too late in the semester, sorry about this date, if you wait too late, you can't just withdraw right before the very end and say, no, nah, I'm going to fail this, so I'm going to withdraw now. If you go past that date, it's, it's a fail anyway because you've gone too far through it, okay? And so that will just be, it will be called a withdraw fail, but it will also have a point score of zero. Um, another one is the census date. This is earlier in semester. Again, the date, I'm very sorry for that. Um, this is where you can try a few weeks, three or four weeks, something like this, into semester, and you can decide whether you want to continue with a topic or not. And if you decide not to, and you withdraw before census date, it's as if you never turned up before in the class, and you don't have to pay for it. If you go past the census date, even if you withdraw without failing, or you fail it, or you get high distinction, whatever, it costs money, okay? So the census date is the cutoff for paying, all right? So they are important dates. Again, I'm sorry for those uh, wrong dates, um, but they are available to you if you Google that or look on the Flinders um, website, you'll find those dates. It's probably in the, the, the planner as well, the calendars. So I'm getting close to the end. Um, grade point average, what is the grade point average? Um, this is an important score for you, okay? It is the average of all of those point scores that I said, high distinction is seven, distinction is six, fail zero, all of that stuff. It's the average of all those point scores for all the topics you have studied in your degree, okay? It's useful for degree transfer and additional study. If you got into university on an ATAR, once you start studying at university, that kind of supersedes, your GPA supersedes your, your um, ATAR, okay? So if you start studying a degree and you get past the first semester or first year or even halfway through and you think, oh, actually, I want to study this instead, then it's your GPA that helps you to make that, that transfer on a competitive basis. Um, if you finish your degree and you think, oh, I want to do, you know, um, I want to do a master's in this area, postgraduate study. I want to keep going because I really like it, okay, and that'll help me get the job that I want. That's another competitive entry and you use your GPA for that. Nobody will use the ATAR at that stage, okay. The GPA is, is um, what you um, collect. So you want to, um, so I'll give you an example of how that works. Um, if you study four topics, get a credit in each of them, and there were five points each, altogether it's 20 points, right? But you've studied four topics. So the GPA, the average is five, okay? That's an easy one. The average is representative of each one. However, if you've got a distinction in two of those, when you add these up, divide them by four, right, six points for the distinctions, you get a GPA of five and a half. And so that is a higher GPA than the other one. I want to point something out to you here. Say you get a high distinction in one, one topic here, but you get a pass in this one, only worth four. They kind of cancel each other out, okay? And you have the same GPA as that previous one. So two credits and two distinctions gives you the same average as a distinction, a pass, a high distinction, and a credit, okay? So every topic counts, right? Every topic counts when you're making this average. And if you have this set, but instead of passing and getting that four, you actually make a fail, that zero is counted in your average and the GPA goes down by a lot, right? So it's important to be aware of how the numbers work, okay? This is how the numbers work. Okay, obviously, it is good to, to, um, to try not to fail those. It's not the end of the world, right? You do it. And again, you have a lot of topics. It doesn't really affect it you know, that much in the long run. You have like all of these topics in your whole degree. But just so you know, all of the, G all of the point scores are treated equally. Okay, so um, the key in all this, because we do get a bit you know, um, ahead of ourselves with grades and thinking about that, Carol Dweck, um, is a Stanford professor of psychology. 
She wrote a book about mindset, and she's worked in that area. Uh, very influential. She says, Gra she said this, grades are a byproduct of engaging deeply and effectively in the learning pro uh, process. So what we can take from this is forget about the grades. Just focus on your learning, enjoy it. Like I said, with all those opportunities, keep reflecting on your own learning progress, push it as much as you can, forget about grades. They'll look after themselves. Assessment is not something you need to worry about and grades are not something you need to worry about. It's just that when you do assessments, when you get grades, try and take feedback from that uh, and move forward, okay? Excellent, I think that's the end. Hopefully. Okay, we talked about high distinctions, distinctions, credits, passes, fails, non-graded passes, all those different options to withdraw, okay, when things get a bit challenging, census date, um, the cutoff for paying, importantly, and your grade point average. So, um, last questions. We have about five minutes. Yes. That's just the uh, highest. Um, then my question is, um, coming from an exchange student, yes. um, I know like, we have like, different standards, but some really like at least 90% of the top grade. Yep. How will this translate then coming, going back to Europe? Yep, so I had a question um, in an international context um, between different systems. Uh, for example, high distinction here is 85%. Um, in another context, it's 90 percent, and you're and you're thinking about the transfer as an exchange when you go back to Europe. What does that mean? I can't directly answer that um, because I'm not completely sure of all that. We have um, uh, some people who um, work with international students and would be able to answer that perfectly. Um, I have worked in Europe and the US and things before, and I kind of know a little bit uh, about this and a, and a bit of an idea. Um, I think that the 85% that you're saying for high distinction and the 90% is otherwise comparable, okay? Um, so I wouldn't really be worried about that too much. It is true, as you say, you don't get the percentage score on your transcript. Um, I believe it is recorded, but it's not on your transcript. Um, but in different jurisdictions, um, there are different grading scales and things like that, and the universities are super aware of that. So if you go through a degree and get all distinctions, uh, even in Europe, it doesn't matter where you go, they will look at that and they will have a good idea for what that means in their context. Yeah, totally. They, they will be able to do that alignment for sure. Um, but specifically, if you want to ask that question, I think the international office... What's the, Tio, what's the name of the international office? It's... That's the International Student Services. Okay, International Student Services. They will absolutely be able to answer that, yeah. Great question. But yes, on the transcript, the percentage doesn't go down. At Flint, this is just the point score in the grade category. Yes? I'm just wondering what the process is between getting credit from previous studies into your own study. Yes, so the process for getting credits for previous study um, to get advanced standing in current study at Flinders, there is a process, uh, recognition of prior learning, um, and you, you will just have to find some web pages there on, on Flinders to find out where to, to do that. Tio, with a um, recognition of prior learning, where's, where's the best place to go? I'd otherwise say go to Flinders Connect and ask them that question. Yes, I think Flinders Connect is the best place for you to go uh, to obtain that information. Alternatively, you may also want to check with the program coordinator. They may have some answers there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does go through a case-by-case -case, um, process, but you're welcome to go through that process and, and, and get credit um, given to you, yeah, for sure. And, and when, when you've done previous study, it's, it's typically, um, they have a good idea for whether it's aligned or not. Um, sometimes it won't be, and I'll say, oh, I'm sorry, we can't offer you anything, but sometimes it absolutely will, and they say, yes, you don't have to do these particular things, yeah. Uh, Matt, I have a question from Bargav online. Uh, he or she asked this question, can I select only one subject for um, enrolment? Yes, so only one subject and, and just for terminology's sake, topic um, per semester, I presume. Uh, my understanding is uh, yes. Um, you just have to um, organise your study load to be part-time such that you take one topic at a time. Um, so that's something to work out with um, the... Uh, 
enrolment services. And again, Flinders Connect would be the best place to ask them. I would go there, right? I had a student who asked this um, to work out how, exactly what you do to do that. But basically, you go from you go to a part-time study load and you select to take one um, topic per semester and you can do that. My understanding is you can do that, yes. It's a part-time load. Yes? Yeah. Um, my, my advice is to ask them, um, ask them because um, with, us, with all assessments, um, there's, there's often not a very strict rule about all of those different things. Um, there is obviously at the university we have a lot of freedom, right? academic freedom. We all have a lot of these different freedoms. Definitely ask them, what do you mean by this participation? You can say, obviously I want to do well and I want to fulfill that criteria. How can I fulfill that criteria? Uh, and they might even tell you when the topic starts, I presume it starts next week, how, how to do that. You know, like for example, if you have um, workshops, they might say you have to turn up to every workshop unless you have a medical certificate or something like this. And that's how they judge that. So yes, that's a, sp a specific question for the topic coordinator, yeah. Do we have any more questions online, Tio? Yes, but they are very specific to certain programs. Uh, okay. For example, there's a question which says, uh, Master of Chemistry has only one core subject, uh, and that's it. So... Uh, that's okay if it's only got... Uh, I mean, like, with all of these specific things, I mean, you have to realise that um, with those colleges, um, they have their own uh, freedom to, to teach their degrees and construct their degrees in the way that they do. There are different accrediting bodies and everything like that which um, have to be met. Um, so all of those specific questions should absolutely go to your degree coordinator, topic coordinators, um, all of that in the college. Uh, we don't sit in the college, we sit on the whole university, um, uh, across the whole university, so we can't answer those specific ones. But absolutely your, your topic coordinators and tutors can help you with, with those. Okay, I, uh, yes, a quick one at the back. I th the question was about um, lectures being recorded. Um, again, it's, it's always individual. Honestly, most of them are recorded, yes. Um, it, but it does depend um, on, on the, the college, the, the study, how big the class is, all of that kind of stuff. The equipment's available. This is recorded because we have equipment available to record it, right, in this lecture theatre. Um, so it is a, a, a um, specific question. But broadly, a lot of lectures are recorded these days. Yes, absolutely, yeah. So I am very aware of the time. Um, it's a little bit past 10.30, so we've gone a little bit over time. Um, thank you very much for coming out today. If you have any more questions, I'll hang around for a little bit. And best of luck with your first semester at Flinders.